Almost every week we highlight media hysteria over Russia, sometimes every night, and every time they apparently take it as a challenge to become more hysterical. This week, from Salon.com, quote, does Vladimir Putin really own Donald Trump? It's more likely than you think. From Foreign Policy, which used to be a real publication, Jared Kushner's growing stench of treason, punishable by death, by the way, from Slate, the end is nigh. The New York Times, meanwhile, wrote a lengthy story about administration efforts to open a back channel with Russia. Doubtless you heard about it. But the paper took 16 paragraphs before mentioning a key fact. Setting up a back channel is perfectly legal and, by the way, has happened before. Former New Hampshire Governor John Sununu called out some of this for what it is. Watch. The only discomfort I have is with folks in the media trying to create a veniality without having the courage to, to specifically tell me what the veniality that I should be concerned about is. You should be concerned if there was collusion. And that's what I don't Congress I don't see any evidence of collusion. Do you? No. That's OK, what, so that's, that's that, that, ends, that should end your reporting well, right there. We're you at should the put an exclamation point after you know. Understood. But we're at the beginning of the investigation. So what you're Congress seven months into the investigation. One anchor honest enough to say, no, I don't see any evidence of collusion. Good for her. Wayne Mary is a former American diplomat to Russia, knows a lot about the country. He joins us tonight. Um, this does seem like the governor's question is the key one, which is what's the crime being alleged here? Do you see it? Well, there are a lot of allegations and a lot of allegations based on leaks, which have not yet been substantiated if they ever will be. Right. I mean, some of the accusations are important if they prove to be true. But let us keep in mind that every new U.S. administration makes contact with foreign governments before it comes into office. I mean, every, every administration does that. That's part of the transition process. I might also note as an American diplomat that we do the same thing with our embassies with incoming governments in other countries. I mean, after elections in countries that I was posted to, we were very closely in touch uh, with the politicians who were going to be coming into office, often before they actually were in office. What I find hilarious about the story is that Jared Kushner apparently suggested speaking in some other venue, perhaps in a secure Russian-controlled venue, because he feared, the Trump people feared, they would be surveilled by U.S. intel agencies and that information would be leaked, which of course it was. <laughs> they were being, the conversation was being surveilled and indeed it was leaked, hence this story. So like, maybe it was a real concern. Well, I think that what Mr. Kushner is alleged to have proposed to Sergei Kislyak, the Russian ambassador, uh, needs to try to be firmed up a, a good deal here. Was he talking about having a means of communication or was he talking about actually making that communication part of a Russian clandestine activity? That would be very different. And at least the leaks, the allegations that we've seen is that Ambassador Kislyak was very cautious and very unresponsive uh, to what was being proposed. Right, because they're of course totally paranoid like a lot of diplomats are. So this is now an article of faith in Washington that Russia hacked our election, whatever that means, that the Trump people are somehow in bed with the Russians, puppets of Putin. True or not, that has real world consequences, does it not, for our country and its relationship with Russia? Uh, it certainly does. I mean, the Russians uh, increasingly are using the word schizophrenia uh, to describe official Washington nowadays. Partly the, the distance between Capitol Hill and the White House on policy uh, some of the struggles going on within the administration. Uh, and they're quite reluctant, I think, uh, to commit themselves to almost any kind of a dialogue with the United States, even if we are prepared for one. But I think you have to keep in mind that we have not yet had the first meeting between the American president and the Russian president. Uh, that's likely to happen in early July uh, on the, the margins of one of the big uh, uh, summit meetings. Uh, but so far, we have not yet even initiated the kind of dialogue with Russia that any president since, uh, since Harry Truman would have had by this point in their so maybe So that, maybe that's the point. So Russia experts I know in Washington believe that part of the purpose of this was an effort to derail Trump's planned detente with Russia. There are people in Washington who are against that for a bunch of different reasons, and so they hamstrung it. Do you think that that's plausible? Well, Russophobia is one of the few things that is really a bipartisan in the United States today. You see it uh, on Capitol Hill in both houses, both parties. 
You also have to keep in mind uh, that what I would call the, the policy elite uh, in the United States, whether liberal or conservative, neoliberal or neoconservative, are really consumed with anger against, against Russia for reasons which to me strike me as is really quite irrational, particularly this demonization of Vladimir Putin. I mean, Ronald Reagan never did that kind of thing. Of Ronald Reagan never called for regime change in Moscow. He was interested in regime behavior change, and he knew that to change another regime's behavior, you have to have some kind of dialogue with it. He was probably a puppet of Andropov, I would imagine. Well, Just kidding. Yeah. Thanks for joining us. My pleasure.